anyway, this, these, these are the furnaces I told you about. If you worked in the, uh, in the malt house, those are the sort of shoes you'd be issued with. That little, that little pokey thing in the corner, if you were eight years old in the 19th century, yeah. and you could come and work in the malt house, and for a penny a day, you would be paid to poke out the holes in the tiles. Mm. This is a 19th century uh, winnowing machine. This is separate the chaff from the grain. And this is here to demonstrate how all the machinery in the brewery and in the malt house would have been run from one steam engine. And all the power from that single engine would go to every machine in the, in the, in the whole complex on a system of the shafts and belts. And in England, there's a term for finishing your shift. You may have come across it called knocking off time. <laughs> knocking off time originally meant you stopped your machine by knocking the belt off. Oh. And so if you've heard the term knocking off time, that's what they used to do. They knocked the belt off the machine and stopped their machine at the end of their shift. <laughs> so that was that. If you come over here, what we've got here is, I've got a question for you. Now, Burton on Trent, Burton on Trent became the most important brewing town, not just in England, but in the entire world, by 1900. Okay. One in four pints of beer drunk, from, drunk by anyone in the United Kingdom by then would have been brewed in Burton. Burton brewed more beer than big cities like London. Mm. Why was Burton so important? It was important for three things. One thing was its location, its central. Second thing is the water in Burton is the best water in the world for making beer. Oh. It doesn't come from the River Trent. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't drink anything that comes from the River Trent because the River Trent comes from Stoke on Trent. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. wouldn't want to drink that. Have you been to Stoke? Um, yes. 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 Well, you'll know what I'm talking about then. <laughs> the water comes from a natural source on the ground, an aquifer. Oh, wow. And the water in that aquifer is special. It's, it's, it's filtered, it's surrounded by rocks and sits on a bed of gypsum. And it makes the water permanently hard. Mm. And it's a perfect water for brewing with. Wow. And the people of Burton have this massive secret of being able to brew the best beer in the world. Mm. So they analyse the water. Mm. Which was ever so clever, wasn't it? And then they did something really stupid. After they'd find out the, the combination of chemicals and salts that made their water special, you know what they did? They told everybody. Oh. So then, if you wanted to make a Burton style beer, you could make it anywhere in the world just by putting those salts and chemicals into, into your water. And that's what people do. And I've had people, brewers from Japan here, brews from America and they do this process and this process is known across the world as Burtonization and uh, as I said I've, I've had brewers from uh, and people in trust in beer from all parts of the world you'd be surprised how far away in fact I had a Mexican here yesterday True. how a Mexican got into this country at the moment is beyond me but they were here True. yeah to the water at the location the other the other one is reckoned to be the hand of the Lord himself. Because what happened was, in the seventh century, that's a long time ago, between the times of the Romans and the Vikings, if you like, seventh century, there was a young girl, and she was a nun, and she lived in Ireland. Her name was Modwin. Have you heard the name Modwin? Yeah. So she's famous in Burn, isn't she? The church is named after Modwin. Modwin lived in Ireland, and she decided that, that God had called her to go on a pilgrimage. And she set off on her pilgrimage in the seventh century to go to Rome. Mm -hmm. And so she started her journey. And part of the way along her journey, she came to this place that was to be Burton on Trent. It wasn't Burton on Trent because it didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Stapenhill is about the oldest bit of Burton. <coughs> but she got here and she was appalled by the paganism. The non-believers, the drunkenness. Mm. She was absolutely appalled by it. I personally, she went to she went she went she went to the Witherspoons in town. And that's that's <laughs> just my story. Anyway, she she got to Rome, did whatever a, a seventh century nun would do in Rome, a couple of selfies for the convent, whatever. <laughs> set off back, and she arrived back here, 
and she decided that she had to stay here. She had to show these heathens the word of God. Mm. She had to convert them. This is in the seventh century. So you're talking around 600 something AD. Mm. And so she, what she did was she built a hermitage out on the, one, of the, one of the big islands on the River Trent. Mm -hmm. And she dug her well. Mm. And that well became very famous as a holy well. Holy water. They reckoned the water in that well would cure anything, even leprosy, blindness, skin, all skin diseases. Miracle after miracle after miracle was reported. And in the Catholic Church, sainthood requires at least two miracles. Mm -hmm. Oh, she easily passed that. Mm -hmm. Then she was beatified and finally canonized. 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 Yeah, get it right. And she became Saint Modwin. And the church in the centre of town is called yeah. Saint Modwin's well, Church. She, isn't mm, it? Yeah. she became. Now, Burton has a saint. So Burton becomes a place of pilgrimage. Mm. So that's Can't the believe story. that, can you? Yeah. Can't. Place of pilgrimage. <laughs> pilgrimage. <laughs> you didn't know you lived in a place like that, did <laughs> no. you? And it wasn't long, in, back in the 10th century, 900 and something, a group of monks founded a monastery here. Okay. And that monastery became very, very famous. And it was those monks that first discovered the quality of the water here for brewing beer. Mm. And the monastery became famous for its beer. In fact, it is said that the monks became rather over-fond of the beer. Oh. And the, the abbot who ran the monastery made a rule, had to bring out rules that limited the monks to drinking only eight pints of strong beer a day. Oh, gosh. And eight pints of wheat beer. <laughs> but it was famous, very famous for its beer. And but in, the, in, in the 16th century, there was a king of England called Henry. Mm. You might ah, have heard of yes. Henry VIII. He was famous for lots of things. But one of the things he did was take over, was nationalise the church in England. Mm. And as a consequence, he confiscated all their lands. Henry did the six wives, right? He's the one with yeah, six yeah, wives, yeah. yeah. He did, that was the least of his, <laughs> the least of the things he did. <laughs> but he, he, he named himself head of the church, and not only did he, not only did he get rid of the monasteries, he took off, he, he confiscated all their lands and sold it to his friends. Oh. He needed to sell it to his friends because he had a war going on with the French and he had to pay for it somehow. Mm -hmm. So that was probably why it happened. And anyway, so, so what happened was then that brewing beer went back to the way it always had been brewed. And that was by ladies in the back of their farmhouses and cottages. And throughout most of history, beer has been brewed by women, oh. not men. And they would brew the beer in the back of their cottage and the trouble was that these cottages belonged to the lords of the manor. Mm -hmm. And the lords of the manor began to realise that some of these ladies were brewing so much beer that they were selling it. Oh. Now, if you, if you own the land and you own the houses, you virtually own the people. Mm -hmm. And they were making money. Okay. What are you going to do? Oh. You're going to take a bit of it. Sure. You're going to want some of that money. Mm -hmm. You're not going to refuse extra money, are you? Yeah. So they tax them, oh. and they had these tax collectors called Connors, who were supposed to be interested in um, in uh, quality control. And the Connors would come and visit the ladies, and they'd say, "Give me two 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 measures of your best beer." And what they would do is they would take one measure and they put it on the table. They take the other measure of beer and they pour it on the bench. And then what they do, they step around and they sit in it. They wore leather trousers. They'd sit in for about half an hour, passing the time of the day, and then they'd stand up. If they stood up cleanly, they would say to the, their wife, you can sell that beer and pay your tax. If, however, they were sticky when they stood up, it meant not enough of the sugar had turned to alcohol, mm. and therefore it wasn't saleable. Mm. So they didn't have to pay the tax. And these Connors were called leather riches, in honour of these people. Just as an interesting aside, there's a, an, an interesting visit. There's a monastery not far from here. It's called Mount St. Bernard Abbey. It's the oldest post-Reformation monastery in England. Mm. 
but the monks there brew beer. Okay. I don't know if they're allowed to drink it, oh, but they brew it. It's very special because it's Trappist beer. Can you, can you visit that monastery? You can visit the monastery. Yeah. You can have, it's a beautiful walk around the monastery. So it's oh, a really? lovely walk, especially on a nice day. Yeah. You can, you, you, there's, there, there are walks around it. There's a, there's a shop there where you'll be served by one of the monks. Mm -hmm. A lot of Catholics go there to have their rosaries blessed. Uh -huh. But in the shop they sell keepsakes and books. Mm -hmm. But they also sell their beer yeah, yeah. that they make there. And that beer is recognised as special because it's called Trappist beer. Mm -hmm. There's only 12 places in the whole world well. that can call themselves Trappist. And that's the only place in England. There's one in America, one in um, Italy, and the rest are in northern France and Belgium those countries but there's only about a dozen in the world and to be trappist you have because you know trappist monks are monks that not, yeah, yeah. they take a vow not to speak to each mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. unnecessarily mm -hmm. uh, amongst lots of other vows but what what the, the beer has to be brewed by the monks or under the supervision of the monks on holy ground on okay. consecrated ground and that's what the trappist beer is Mm -hmm. and it's not to be confused with things called Abbey beers, mm -hmm. which are just brewed in factories, really. Yeah. Okay, yeah. right, okay. Here we go. Now, what you do next with your beer, you get bored, you know, and you want to stop, just tell me, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. What, what you do next with your beer is you want to, you want to get that sugar out of, the, out of the malt, out of the grain. So you, so you grind it up into, into a powder, well, sort of a very, a very coarse flour, it's called grist. Mm. And what you do is you put your grist into a mashing tub or a mashing tub. People who make their own beer at home, this is just a bucket in the back in the spare room. What? Or if you do it in a big brewery over there, it's huge five and a half thousand gallon containers, massive containers. However, the process is the same. You put your mash into the bottom here and you fill it up with water. The brewers call it brew liquid, the water they brew with. If, at about 60 degrees and you let it mash or steep. And if you live around here you know if you make a pot of tea you mash the tea. If you do it in other parts of the country you brew the tea. Wow. But in this part and that mash the tea comes from the brewing industry. Mm -hmm. This establish is the same in South mm -hmm. Yorkshire because they're all big brewing places and you let it sit on the mash and it